right, I'm expecting this to be working. Microphone, great. All right, so this is uh, only you can prevent forest fires proactive approach to monitoring your cloud. If I can work on this. Well, well, there we go. Okay, so we're part of the Time Warner Cable OpenStack team. Uh, we operate an internal cloud for Time Warner Cable and have customer-facing workloads on it, and our, one of our main initiatives is just to avoid customer uh, work interruptions, so incidents. Quick agenda, I'll cover the what and why. Ryan will cover the visualization, and Brad will cover uh, technical challenges. So quickly, just trying to expose our thought process on this. Um, and starting off with what's really motivating us, uh, I find that most people assume they know why they're collecting performance metrics. Um, it's not always obvious, and there's lots of different reasons to do this, but these are our two number one reasons for doing this. Number one is to avoid customer work interruptions, and number two is to make our work-life balance better. Um, and number two is becoming more important all the time, uh, just because there is quite a bit of stress when the on-call rotation comes around. So what are we talking about here? Uh, it's nothing really special, but trying to be deliberate and um, specific about how we're going about our uh, monitoring and then using that monitoring information to produce a desired result. So basically prioritizing what kind of problems we're trying to address, create system models. I find when I ask people how they expect their cloud to operate, you get a variety of answers and usually they're conflicting. Um, so, but trying to start simply and just progressively build a model that your team can uh, work it around. And then that all drives to creating questions. Questions to be answered with your data. And then at that point you're ready to source data, visualize it, and hopefully answer a question. Um, it's very common for us anyway not to get the question answered the first time, so we have to iterate. Right? And then for me, one of the most important things is to define an action. Uh, going through all this work and not being able to do something about it is really where we get our value. I mean, but that's the problem that we often find is that we'll source data, make slides or uh, graphs, and still not really have a defined action uh, behind it. So to answer the question, why is this really different, the tr what I'd call the traditional thought process is to collect as much data as you can and keep it forever, or as long as you can, and then hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, use it in your work or make a difference. Uh, this is a false assumption uh, from my standpoint. What I'd call a new thought process is really starting with a question. And then once you have a question to be answered, go look for the data that will answer that question, put it in a format that allow you to use it, and then ask yourself, did that help? If not, repeat. So this is a very simplistic slide. Um, I really think the last point is the most important one here. What you want to do is be able to come up with a question that if you can answer it, will lead you to an action that will make a difference in your cloud. You can avoid a problem. That's what you want to do. Okay, so these guiding principles, they're really my guiding principles that I've developed in the last year just working with this. Uh, they're truly open for debate, but the potential value of data reduces over time, but the cost of that data increases over time. And the true value of the data is driving a decision or uh, an action. And then graphs are tools, they're not the product. And humans aren't good at this. If you accept that last bullet, then taking a structured approach is much more natural. But most people think they're very good at this, and I think that leads them to make a lot of mistakes. And then lastly, um, this whole approach was really prompted by exposure to data science. And uh, Coursera has a number of classes. If you're interested in this type of approach, this is a great way to get started on it. But John Hopkins University has a specialty in this, and they do a good job on these classes. Okay, and then Ryan, you're gonna... All right, so when we got started with this, um, we were just using Nagios for a purely alarm-based approach. This is great. It helps you respond to problems quickly and fix them. You know where the problems are at. But it doesn't help you get ahead of the problems. And it's hard to go back and diagnose the problems using alarms 
once it's uh, once it's passed. So we've been moving towards more of a time series visualization approach. It's a lot easier to consume the data, to understand it. You can see the trends, whether you want to use that for planning or to see whether you're headed for failure. And you can also see correlations, so you know if one thing is causing another problem um, or if one thing is a predictor. For instance, this is a snapshot of one of our storage graphs. The top panel here was designed so that we could see how our capacity was being used. Um, I'm not sure how well you can read that, but that green is just available, and then the other colors are split out into how we're, uh, storage that's being used for instances, volumes, that sort of thing. The bottom panel was or designed so that we could see the health of our Ceph cluster, and it just shows the different states of the placement groups. So you can see in that one that there is uh, that little blue section at the bottom that's remapping placement groups, and then those red spikes are degraded health uh, or degraded placement groups. And you can see from the combination of the two that we were actually undergoing a Ceph cluster expansion when the remapping started and then the degraded health groups or placement groups started. So it was obviously a Ceph cluster expansion that went wrong. For our data collection and our um, displays, we're using a combination of Manaska and Grafana. Manaska is the OpenStack monitoring as a service solution. It's flexible, it's scalable, and it's multi-tenant, which means not only can we use this for our own monitoring, but we can provide this information to our customers as well. And for Grafana, or for the visualization, we're using Grafana. It's a time series data visualizer. Uh, it's open source and it also supports the multi-tenancy so that we can allow our customers to have individualized dashboards as well. So where's this worked well for us? Well, when we got started with this, or right before we started setting this up rather, we were having an issue with network slowness. It would appear randomly, last for um, a random amount of time, and then disappear without warning. And we had a hard time tracking this problem down. All we really knew was we managed to track it down to specifically APIs that seemed to affect all of them. And we were getting conflicting results from different people who were testing it. So we started monitor monitoring our APIs as soon as we set this up. And from this graph, you can see that we got our first confirmation of the problem and also an idea of what was actually happening here. This is just the time it takes to create a server, and you can see it slowly gets worse and worse and worse until it hits a point of failure where it just kind of bottoms out there. Uh, and then it just recovers randomly. We also found that the Keystone tokens were, a great, or were another great indicator of this problem. Um, when we were just testing this before we had the visualization, people would get conflicting results here which you can see pretty clearly there. Sometimes tokens take the normal amount of time, sometimes they take um, far longer. So we also found by comparing these graphs that this was a leading indicator of the problem. And the tokens would often slow down up to even half an hour before we started seeing these problems in our other services. So this helped us get ahead of the problem. And when we saw Keystone starting to slow down, we could go in and do some maintenance. In, in our case, we discovered that restarting the APIs helped with the problem, so we could restart our APIs quickly and prevent this from becoming an issue that was even noticeable to, cu to customers. Um, so like I said, this was a great example for us um, of success. It was the first time we used this. Um, but of course, this is still a slightly reactive pr approach. We were still waiting for Keystone to start showing that there was a problem, and then we, we would react to that even though we were getting ahead of the real issue. Um, but this is something we're still working on, is getting farther ahead of the issues. Of course, just having the data doesn't mean we always succeed. And recently, we were rolling out new kernels to all of our nodes, and it performed fine in, de in our dev environments and our staging environments. But once we got to prod, we started seeing node failures um, with soft lockups. And once we dealt with the immediate issue, and we went back and we started looking for any indications of why this might have happened, we found that at this time that we deployed the new kernel, there was a significant change in the pattern of CPU usage. The customer percent doubled or even tripled in some cases. 
And this might not have been, or this might not be immediately traceable back to the kernel issue, but if we had noticed this at the time, then we would have taken a closer look at the kernel and maybe not deployed it to production without further testing. Um, there were several reasons why we didn't catch this. One was just that we had too much data. We didn't have enough people to sift through it, um, and we didn't have the visualization for it. A lot of our dashboards weren't created at that point. Um, we also just didn't, this is a new process to us, and we didn't know what to ask. We deployed our, the new kernels to dev and to staging, and we didn't see any immediate failures, so we called that good, and we went on to prod. But if we had asked ourselves if there were any signs of failure, anything that would indicate that in an environment with higher load or other factors that it would fail, then we might have caught it earlier. So we're still improving. Um, these are kind of the three big points that I wanted to make. We are trying to capture less data. Early on, network data was a big culprit for us. By default, when we set up Manaska, it was capturing network information on all of our devices. When we went back and reviewed that, we found that we could cut out nearly 70% of our data, and that has helped us narrow in on network problems a lot faster. We're also adding better visualization. We started on a branch of Grafana 1. We recently rolled out Grafana 2.6 to our production environment, and Grafana 3 is coming out soon, so we have high hopes for that. We've also just been creating more dashboards so that more of our data is easily consumable. And lastly, um, testing is something that we haven't done much of up to this point, or at least this sort of testing. But we're hoping to do more of it, because if we know where the stress points are and at what point our cloud fails, then we'll be able to see if we're actually headed for a disaster. Um, one last point I want to make is that we don't just use this for ourselves, we also give our customers access to this data. We monitor all of our customers' VMs for basic health information, and we provide them with this default dashboard, where we are also in the process of adding router monitoring, so that we'll be able to um, provide them with that information as well. And this isn't just to help them, it helps us. Um, we are selfish that way. Um, when customers have better uh, a better view into what's going on in their instances, then they're much less likely to come to us with problems that they can fix themselves or that have nothing to do with us. And also, when they do have to come to us with problems, it means they'll come to us with information that will allow us to solve the, the issue faster. And of course, when customer instances are more stable and their applications are performing better, we just get to deal with happier customers. Brad, you're up. Okay, thanks, Ryan. I should start out by apologizing. The Marantis bear was going to make an appearance as Smokey the bear, but um, got into a barrel of fermented apples at Stack City last night and is still recovering. So apologies for that. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit and da -da -da, yeah, uh, talk about some of the nuts and bolts behind our monitoring solution. <clears throat> so. Uh, we've, we stood this up a year, maybe a little more than a year ago, um, and we'd heard really good things about the Manaska project. Um, we liked the fact that it graphed data over time, um, the fact that you could alert on metrics that were coming in. Um, currently, and, and even then, as a back-end metrics database, InfluxDB and Vertica are the two supported uh, databases. Uh, Vertica is an HPE proprietary database, and um, Influx DB is an open source database, or, or was until a few weeks ago. Their, their clustering has recently uh, become uh, closed source, I think. But um, at the time, uh, unfortunately, 0 0.9, uh, the version 0 0.9 of InfluxDB was coming out, and its clustering really wasn't stable. So after spending uh, several months with that, we, we decided to meet our um, delivery deadline by using Vertica. And so as such, um, most of the technical challenges or, or what turned out to be scale issues for us uh, were related <coughs> to Vertica and, and were ended up being Vertica specific. So the, the biggest problem that we had when we initially stood our cluster up is we had no way to guarantee that irrespective of the number of queries that were coming into the system, we, we could guarantee that data was being written into the system. 
And so the main thing that we did to uh, fix that was Vertica has this feature uh, called resource pools. I don't know how familiar people are with Vertica, um, but it allows you to allocate uh, more threads and memory to one process or set of queries and, or uh, database statements versus another. So by allocating more resource to our persister pool, um, we can now guarantee that it, you know, irrespective of the number of queries coming in, the writes still make it into the database. Um, the other thing we started out with, Vertica stores its data with what's called projections, and so when you first set up your schema, you decide how you want Vertica to store that data. And we had been using a segmented projection, and, what, and we had segmented the data uh, by OpenStack project. And um, what that did is like put my data on two, one or two nodes in the cluster and, and maybe another project's data on another couple of nodes in the cluster which sounded like a good idea for distributing the data, except that um, as we tried to horizontally scale our database cluster, um, it really didn't matter how much we scaled it from a project perspective because all of the data was really only on two nodes in the database. Um, it took us a while to figure that out, but once we did, we switched our, uh, the main measurements table or the, the metrics table to a replicator projection, and that was great. So now we have horizontal scaling. We can we can uh, grow the database cluster, and any node in the in the database cluster can satisfy any query. So that's finally given us horizontal scaling, which is great. Um, the other thing we learned about Vertica is that uh, it prefers uh, larger batch writes at less frequent times. Um, so we were we were very chatty initially when we set our our cluster up, and so it was, we had, you know, bunches of threads writing little bits of data to get it in as quickly as we could, um, and it was just too much for, for our Vertica cluster, and so we slowed that down, increased our batch sizes, and um, and now it's great, because it frees Vertica, it, it, it handles big batches really well, stuffs them in very quickly, but it frees, uh, you know, the database up to, to satisfy getting data out of it, which is great. Another big one, Ryan, Ryan uh, touched on it a little bit, and, and it's um, just kind of maintaining the size of our database and making sure it just doesn't grow without bounds. So it took us a while to figure out the, uh, the network metric thing that he talked about, and, and he's not kidding, we, we really did delete like 70% of the data at the time in the database. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, we're pruning our metrics, and I've got another slide uh, coming up here that talks about our retention policy and, and pruning, but keeping control of the size of that data has been really helpful. Okay, so if, you, if you've been going to some of the Manaska talks this week, you've, you've seen uh, Roland and Company's slides on Manaska architecture, hopefully, and so I'm not gonna repeat that here, but here's a slide that you might not have seen, and this would have been helpful um, when we were setting our cloud up to have something, you know, a, a working example of how people have deployed Manaska. Okay, so on the left is essentially all the client-side nodes that we have, and this, this slide uh, is a single region. Uh, we have two, two regions, two data centers, and so um, we're monitoring about 250 physical nodes on the left side of this graph of the, of the different uh, types of nodes, and all of those nodes have um, the, the lightweight uh, Manaska agent, a Python agent on them, sending uh, default system metrics <coughs> Uh, into the back end, into Manaska. And then in the, uh, we also have a, our Isinger monitoring node, and that's typically where we take the custom uh, Manaska plugins that we write for data that, that's not part of the default Manaska install and push metrics from there. So all that goes through uh, load balancers and, and hits the back end. And so on the right, um, in each region, we have a three node API cluster. Um, and so that runs the, the whole Manaska stack. Um, it runs, you know, the, the API, the persister. Um, if, if you've been to some of the architecture talks, we've got Apache Kafka running there, Zookeeper, Apache Storm, uh, the, a notification process. And, and now with uh, Grafana 2, um, we also have the Grafana API itself hosted on that three-node cluster. And then behind that, uh, we've grown our, in each region, our, our, our database cluster to be six nodes. Um, and this is working, this is, this is humming right along for us right now. We're, we're happy with this. But what does that get us? So here's uh, some measurements taken maybe two, two weeks ago by our QA team. 
Um, right now, with that configuration, um, we ran some tests, uh, like how much data can we push into the cluster and how much can we get out of it? Um, so pushing data in right now, um, th our threshold, uh, 41,000 metrics per second is about our threshold for what we can push in and, and have the persister or the Kafka consumer processes uh, still keeping up. So we can go over that and, and it's a message bus. It just, it builds up and then eventually the persisters catch up. But this is currently with this, with this uh, cluster size are about the threshold at which um, Kafka or our persister processes or our consumers can't keep up. Not that data gets lost. It just doesn't immediately make it into the database. Um, and then getting data out. So right now with our current configuration, um, with the JMeter test that simulates 30 concurrent users just hammering the database for about 10 minutes, um, getting uh, an average of like 15 days worth of data on average, um, over that 10 minute period we can retrieve uh, 55,000 metrics per second. And, and, and that's just our current cluster size. Now, th now that we know we can horizontally scale, we we kind of know where we're at capacity-wise and what to do if, if that's not enough. Um, I should also point out that this is, this, is, uh, this is tests run against our production system, not an idle test system. So these are conservative numbers because it's, it's the system that's up and ingesting our infrastructure metrics. Um, some of our customers, we've, just last month, we uh, released this as beta for, for, our, for our internal Time Warner cable projects. Um, so this is an active system, so these are pretty conservative numbers um, given that it, you know, it was still servicing all of our dashboards and, and our day-to-day -day monitoring. In terms of uh, what kind of footprint that, that ends up being, so I, I, we, I told you we stood this cluster up like a year ago, a year and a half ago almost. Um, we've only got five months of data because we had a bug in the prune script that, that we wrote and we inadvertently had been deleting our infrastructure data. Um, and that's bad and I'm glad I didn't, Jason didn't fire me for that, but thank you. Um, but that translates to two, about two, less than two, <laughs> two terabytes worth of data right now in Vertica. So we, Vertica is a, a paid product. Um, I think we have a 10 terabyte license, and so in five months we're 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 still well under. It's really like 1.6, so it's not not a huge uh, storage footprint uh, inside Vertica. Um, we we've taken a couple of me uh, measurements of a, of a of a day, you know, of metrics coming into the into the database, and our infrastructure right now is about 5,200 metrics per second. Um, so that's a little over 10 percent of our capacity uh, right now. And uh, I don't know if it's worthwhile or not, but if you do a row count on our measurements table, five months of data is about 40 billion uh, measurements in the, in the database right now. So these last two bullets, that's, that's our current uh, retention strategy. So we've, we've got a script that runs nightly um, for non-infrastructure projects. Uh, we delete data anything older than six weeks uh, by default. And our plan, now that we've fixed the bug in our pruning script, um, is to keep 13 months worth of data for, for ourselves. Um, we do have the ability with the, the script that we wrote to take a special request from customers if, if they feel like this isn't enough for them. Um, so we can kind of work around that. But, but going forward, this is kind of our default, default plan. Check the time. So we tried to think about this uh, from the perspective of if we if we were standing this up today, if we were if if there's a team in the room that's thinking about trying Manaska, what what might we do differently? Um, we kind of hinted about it, but we really didn't follow the process that Steve talked about when we first started. So we were so excited to get it up and running and working. We pretty much took every agent plugin that 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 was available and worked and started shoving data into the database and. And quickly found out that that's that at least our opinion, right? Our opinion is that's not the right approach. It's better to be intentional and only push data in that you're going to uh, try to answer a question uh, with, or in and and can actually do something with. The other mistake we made was uh, we we had the entire Manaska API stack and uh, the database on the same node, <coughs> and we met with the Vertica support team and got our hands slapped in the first. Uh, 30 seconds. They're like, you can't do that. Vertica wants the whole node. We're we're we're, we're a greedy database, and so that led to us splitting it, splitting the database off of that API node that runs the rest of the stack. 
Um, another thing that came out of uh, our our onsite with the Vertica support people is the first. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a tool that should be part of the product, in my opinion, but the first thing they do when they show up to a customer site who's uh, bitching or complaining about, um, we're not recording, are we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> complaining about uh, their database not working is they have a little Python script that runs like the magic commands against the database that tells them you know, where your bottlenecks are. Um, it's called vBuddy Lite, and, and uh, they were glad to leave it with us, and they gave us permission to put it in our um, GitHub repo so you can find that if you look for uh, Puppet Vertica, the little module that we wrote. So we're, we're now we're putting that on our nodes and it's a great tool. It's, it, they they, they kind of minimize the value of it. They're like, well, all it does is run a bunch of commands or uh, SQL queries. And it's like, well, yeah, but we didn't know what we should run and that, that thing does. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and then the other thing is even, even like two or three weeks ago, we, we re-ran we we periodically run it and found that um, found another bug in in um, the API process where uh, we a query wasn't fitting in memory in inside our API resource pool. So it's a great tool if you're going to use Vertica. I highly recommend it. And if and we have some links here at the end that can help you find that. Um, yeah. And so then uh, just recently we. We've grown the Vertica cluster to tr try to increase our concurrency uh, numbers. And it seems to work really well. Right now we're at a two to one ratio of database node to um, API node. And, and when we really hammer the system, um, things are pretty balanced in terms of CPU and memory across the cluster. So it feels, you know, at least where we're at right now with our, our workload, it feels right. Um, and then finally, like if you stood a cluster, or if you installed Manaska today, you'd be where we were. Which database do we use? Um, InfluxDB, it's stable now, or more stable than it was when we started out. And, and, and we're kicking the tires. Um, and, but yet we have a great track record with Vertica now. We're very happy with it. I mean, things could always be better, but it's stable and it performs um, with these you know, things that we've worked out. Um, but the upstream community is talking about supporting Cassandra too. So um, sadly, I don't have an answer for that one. If you were looking for one, I, if we did it today, we'd, we'd just have to evaluate all three and, and then see where we go from there. I'm checking my time. Doing okay, this last slide. Okay, um, so this is kind of Time Warner Cable's upstream wish list. We talked a little bit about this in our breakout sessions with uh, Roland and company today. The first is that we're using a forked version of Grafana right now. We forked, or Ryan uh, did all the work for um, getting uh, Keystone integration into Grafana, but he had to change the Grafana code proper to make that happen. So we're using a fork of Grafana 2.6 right now. Um, we're in conversation with the Rain Tank folks, and they're excited to. Uh, you know, engage with OpenStack, so they're talking about adding that um, in Grafana uh, officially. Um, I know I don't know half of what Ryan knows about that, so if you have questions about that, talk to him. But we'd love to get off of the fork uh, that we have right now of Grafana. Um, another thing is we we just have this kind of hand-built script that runs through Cron right now that decides how much or, or decides how much data to, to keep in the database, or rather prune out of the database. Um, and we'd like to push that into the API. Um, so it would behave much like Nova or Neutron, wh where you can set a quota for a number of instances or floating IPs or something. So, and, we would want, and, we, and we want that to be uh, you know, scoped to a project. So, a prod so one project can have more or less data than others. Um, what we're discovering, um, third bullet, g give the customers the ability to prune their own data. So uh, we're keeping six weeks worth of their data, but even in our process of writing custom plugins and pushing our own custom metrics into Manaska, there's a life cycle there. And, and what we found is we don't get it right the first time. So you, you push some metrics in, and then you get to the point of trying to graph it in Grafana, and you realize, well, I, I should have added this dimension so I could you know, split it out by region or split it out by, you know, whatever dimension makes sense. And so part of the life cycle, and we, and we, we, we anticipate that we're going to see this with the customers that are using Manaska in our cloud right now, is that they're going to they're gonna push the wrong metrics in, and, it's gonna, and, it, and they're going to want to delete that. Um, so we'd, we'd like to see the ability to 
let customers delete their own data if, if they so choose. Um, and, and they could wait six weeks, you know, because it'll drop off after six weeks, but, but that's an irritating amount of time to stare at a mistake. Um, let's see, and then, th and then just a few more things that we'd like to do to uh, improve performance that, that we've identified. Um, we've got a patch upstream right now that HPE is working on, um, and it will it, it will make our graphs lightning fast compared to the way they are today by um, by making by having the API return multiple metrics in a single query. Uh, one of the dashboards that Ryan showed, so it showed like all the the CPU utilization for um, you know ten instances or whatever, and that translates to ten API calls, ten database calls, and it's easy enough in the database to just do that in one in one shot. So um, that patch is close to landing. And we're excited about that. That's going to be great. Um, we've also talked about caching in the API layer. If you if you really get down into the guts of what the API is doing right now in the database, um, it makes a lot of repetitive queries to, to figure out which dimension set IDs um, to to use to query my data or anybody else's data, and um, they just get repeated over and over. And typically, they're returning the same thing. So it's begging to get cached uh, in the API layer. And then finally, a couple of like last uh, last things that we haven't finished or tied off after after we met with the Vertica folks. They gave us some recommendations in terms of horizontally scaling. Um, we could actually reduce the amount of chatter between the Vertica nodes if we uh, provide a key value hint that tells the, that basically says, "Hey, you don't have to talk to other nodes in the in the in the database um, or in our, in in our cluster." We know that. You know the data is local, so you can tell Vertica that, and it'll kind of reduce traffic between nodes and speed it up even further. And then they recommended right now we're for our main measurements table because we, uh, in order to dedupe data that's being pushed in to some of the tables, um, we're we're writing data into a temporary table and then merging that into the real table, um, and Vertica really doesn't like that. It's a, an extremely inefficient way to do that. And so they've given us, with, with Vertica 7.2, there's a better way to do that. You can um, push data straight in with a copy statement. And if you tell Vertica that uh, to basically do that deduping for you. So there's our list. That's, that's our wish list role. And I hope you took a screenshot of that. OK, and just some, just some links uh, that, w that we talked about. Um, yeah, and that may, that top one will lead you to a whole bunch more if you if you're interested. So, I think we're right on time. Um, I think every after three days, if we don't have to remind people, if you have questions, to come up to the come up to the microphones. But that's it for our for our slides. I'll leave that up there. I can't see. All right, thanks.